Good morning. Pastor Mark Driscoll here from Oakdale Free Methodist Church. A good happy Monday morning to you. Good to see you this morning. Hope that you're doing well. Hope that you had a good night's sleep, good weekend, and are ready for another week. We're approaching Thanksgiving Day. Every day ought to be Thanksgiving, but uh, we're approaching the official Thanksgiving. I hope you I hope you enjoy that. I hope you're able to spend some time with loved ones and and just to give thanks to God for all that He's given to you. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, uh, thank you for your love and your presence. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Uh, Lord, for bringing us together in this way. Lord, as we approach Thanksgiving Day, we want to celebrate your goodness because it's through you that we have life and salvation and peace and provision. Lord, even in all circumstances, we can trust in you because you are good and you're faithful. And Lord God, we rest entirely on you and we give you thanks today. We pray that you'd lead those that are hurting today, that are looking for direction, that today would be a day of finding you. We we'll pray for those that are sick today. Lord, for your healing touch to be upon them. Lord, those that are displaced and um, without shelter and, and uh, the basic needs. God, for your provision to be with them. For those still recovering from the flood, Lord God that you would give them help and strength and hope, Lord. God, we pray uh, that you guide us and lead us, Lord, as we look into your word right now. Lord, that you speak to us and encourage us and strengthen us, challenge us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to uh, begin by asking you this question. Have you ever um, felt like you disappointed God? Um, that's a hard feeling, isn't it? I, I've talked to uh, many students at times who will who will come to me and say, you know, I just I just feel like I, I can't pray because I feel like I, I did this or I did that or uh, I failed in some way and, and I feel like God's disappointed in me. God's disappointed in somehow. And uh, the, our text today uh, shows us a very important idea and that is that you really can't disappoint God. Uh, you didn't disappoint him. I want you to know today, and now I didn't say you didn't sin. I didn't say you didn't need to repent and get things right with God. I didn't say that. that. That might be true. It may be that you've fallen into something that was wrong, and, and, and God's dealt with you about it, and you need to come to him by faith and, and get it right. And uh, I encourage you to do that. Uh, it may be that you've already done that, and you've prayed, and you've said, Lord, forgive me for this mistake that I made, and I'm... I'm so sad, but then then you're beating yourself up, and you're going, oh, I'm disappointed God, and he's, he doesn't want anything to do with me because I've disappointed him. I've gone beyond uh, what he expected me to do, right? And, uh, and certainly God has expectations of us, and certainly God has call and requirement of us. But the fact of the matter is, you can, you can fall short of the glory of God. We all do. You can fall short of God's purpose and plan. You can grieve the Holy Spirit. You can do all sorts of things. But one thing you can't do, you can't disappoint God. In order for you to disappoint God, well, look at it this way. Who has ever disappointed you? Has your children disappointed you? Maybe a, a person in a relationship disappointed you? Maybe your boss or, or an employee disappointed you? And why they disappoint you? Because you expected them to do one thing and they did another. You expected them to show up at a certain place, and they didn't show up. You expected them to fulfill an obligation, and they didn't fulfill it. And you thought they would, but they didn't. Here's the rub. God never is surprised at you. He's never. He knew what he was getting when he got you in the first place. And, and so the thing is today is one of the biggest traps that we live in is this feeling of disappointment. That, oh, you've done it now. You've gone too far. Uh, it's almost like we think God didn't expect it like he didn't know you were going to mess up he didn't know when you first came to him that one day you were going to make this mistake and you were going to get off the trails oh my goodness can you imagine god in heaven oh no you know people have these concepts of god they they, they act like jesus is just sitting up in heaven wringing his hands and doing a face palm and we have pictures of jesus going oh he doesn't do that he didn't, in order for him to do that, in order for him to be so reactive, he would have to be surprised at us. And he's not. Uh, he knew what he was getting when he got you. And yet, the great news is that he received you anyway by faith. And he saved you 
by His wonderful grace. Uh, now, is that permission to continue in sin? No. Is that permission to to uh, just keep living a disobedient life? Absolutely not. Um, he calls us to faith and obedience, and and so yeah, if, if you're in that place where you're 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 not walking with Him, He's calling you back. What I want you to see is that you don't have to be afraid that somehow. You you did something God wasn't expecting. You you threw God a curve. <laughs> I mean, really think about it. Can you just laugh at that for a minute? <laughs> you threw God a curve. I mean, you are so cool and so creative and so brilliant that somehow you managed to do something that caught God off guard. And can you imagine God <laughs> sitting on the throne going, Oh my goodness, I had no idea. I just you know, I just never saw it coming. <laughs> think about it. and just laugh at yourself for a minute because but see, we all feel that way, don't we? Every one of us, I've done it. And you've, we've all felt that way. I want to show you a story in the Bible. In Luke uh, chapter 22, it's just a short little snippet. It's here. Uh, it takes place at the Last Supper. And Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he's giving them final instructions. And, and it actually is a very serious time. It is, it's one of the most intense times of Jesus' earthly life. And uh, Jesus finds himself... Uh, at facing imminent betrayal. He knows he's about to be denied, betrayed, beaten, um, just falsely accused, rejected, and, and crucified on a cross. And he knows every bit of it. Uh, he knows it. And so he, he, he begins to tell his disciples what's about to unfold. Now in verses 31 to 34, we see this short section of this conversation. And I think it's very helpful to us today. Listen to this. Jesus says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you've turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you've denied three times that you know me. What a what a hard thing. You know, Peter, Simon Peter, loved Jesus so much. Um he stumbled all over himself and yeah, he was a he could be a loose cannon and he could he could, you know, go off the deep end a few times. But I'm gonna tell you what. And he was sometimes like a bull in a china shop. But Peter loved the Lord Jesus Christ with all of his heart. Uh he totally just loved Jesus. There there was nothing nothing but love. Right, uh, Jesus had had so radically changed Peter's life. Peter desired to do anything for Jesus, and so you need you understand that this guy totally loved Jesus with everything he had, and yet was unable when the hour came. He was unable uh, to push through, and Jesus knew that was going to happen. And Peter uh, even argued with him. He had, more than once, we see Peter arguing with Jesus, which is just foolish. But Jesus says, Simon, now let me just take this apart, what Jesus said to him. He said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you. Now, Satan is making demands of something he can't ultimately have. Uh, he did that with Job. Remember back in the Old Testament, he demanded the opportunity to mess with Job. And, and, and of course, God said, <laughs> go for it. Uh, it's just not going to work. Satan loves to demand what he cannot have. Um, that's that's his whole thing. Uh, this pride of him and pride of the enemy. And he he demands. And then, but here's the interesting thing. And I, I didn't realize this at first. But it says that he might sift you like wheat. But now in that phrase, sift you like wheat in the Greek text, that you is plural. So what he's saying is, Satan has demanded you, Peter, so that he can sift all you disciples like wheat. He's not just after Peter, he's after the whole bunch. And Satan has made this demand, I want to get him, and I want to get those apostles. I'm going to show you they're not, they're not anything, as if God doesn't already know what they're made of. And so Satan is, is so deceived in his own pride that he, can't, he just can't get it. That God knows our frame, the Bible says. He is mindful that we are but dust. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our limitations. He knows what we're made of. 
There's one place where Jesus, where it says that Jesus would not commit himself to the people because he knew all men. And he didn't need anybody to tell him what people were made of. He doesn't need anybody to tell him what we we're made of, right? He doesn't, he doesn't need that. And so he tells Peter, he says, look, the devil is after you guys. The devil is after you guys. He said, but I've prayed for you. I love that. I've prayed for you. Jesus, our intercessor. The Bible tells us that even in heaven, he's interceding for the saints. Isn't that great news? To know that the Son of God is a living, constant intercession for you. He's constantly standing in the gap for you because he knows what you're made of and he knows what the devil's made of. You see, there was two things he knew here. He knew what Peter was capable of. He knew how vulnerable Peter was and he knew the attitude of the devil and he knew what the devil wants to do. The devil's a liar. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And Jesus knew that about him. So Jesus knows all these things. And we act sometimes like he doesn't know what's going on. Uh, some of the ways we pray are hilarious and uh, because we're telling him stuff he already knows. And so he, he didn't ask us for a news report. He asked us to make requests. And so we're, we're trying to fill Jesus in and help him understand what life's about. The Bible says that he, uh, he, he is the great high priest who's been tempted in every way like we are yet without sin. He says we don't have a high priest who's not uh, who doesn't understand where we are because he's been tempted in every way. Jesus has been there. He knows what it's like. And so he gets that. Now, but but we're going to move into, into that a little more detail here. But he he knows who we are. And and Peter, of course, being who he was, tried to prove to Jesus that he was strong enough and that he was capable and he could do it. And he says to Jesus, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And Peter meant every word of it. He did. He, he was willing. He had visions in his mind of if Jesus died, I'm going to die right beside him. And if anybody tries to mess with Jesus, I'm going to defend him to the end. In fact, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter pulls out a sword and he starts going to, going to battle for Jesus. Right? And so Peter really meant it. I'm willing to go to you to prison and to death. The problem is, is that Peter, uh, it was sincere, it was deep, it was real, but sincerity is not enough in the day of battle. Sin Let me say that again. Sincerity is not enough in the day of battle. When the devil comes after you and he wants to sift you like wheat and he wants to hit those weak, vulnerable places in your life, being a sincere person isn't enough. You know, the Bible tells us to flee from immorality. You're not strong enough to battle that. It says to flee from iniquity because you're not strong enough to battle it on your own. And, and I, the, some of the most dangerous thing I hear Christians saying is, I can handle it. I've got this one. I'm, 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 I've got this. No, you don't. You don't understand that the devil prowls about like a roaring lion seeking somebody to devour. I don't want to give glory to the devil, but he's slick and he's deceitful and your flesh is weak and you don't have the power in and of yourself to overcome. And so here's the thing is that Jesus knew that about Peter. He knew what Peter was going to do. In fact, he says it. He tells him. He says, Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the morning rooster isn't going to crow until you've denied three times that you even know who I am. And Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen. He knew what Peter was made of. He knew what Peter was capable of. Now, here's the thing. Jesus says two things to Peter. Number one, I know you. And number two, I love you. Um, and th that's the thing that we can be grounded in, is that he knows you, and yet he loves you. you there's no fooling him. There's no uh, pompous uh, propping yourself up and saying, Lord, let me show you how great I can be for you. He, he knows that, that you are flesh, and you are broken, and you are not everything you should be. And no, so get out of this culture that says Jesus thinks you're enough. He doesn't think you're enough. You're, you're not enough. If you were enough, you'd have an idol on your hands. Look, he, he's not interested in you being enough. He says, I'm enough. See, that's the Christian song. The Christian song isn't, I somehow made it. You see, that's the world's song. I didn't make it. Jesus is enough. He's enough. And now, Peter would discover this later. I love what Jesus says after he warns Peter. He says, look, 
And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. That's, that's some powerful stuff. Now, that statement means a couple of things. Number one, it says, when you have turned again, means that Jesus knew that there would be victory. Aren't you great? Isn't that great news? He knew that there's going to come a time of turning, that Peter was going to fight this battle. He was going to lose this battle. But when you have, not if, when you have turned again, right? You see, because that's the thing is that Jesus says you, you're going to have some battles. You're going to have some failures. You're going to have some brokenness. But you know what? When you have turned again, I'm going to give you something to do. You see, there's hope. Now, it also means a second thing that the world doesn't like. And a lot of Christians don't like this. And this is not very popular, but here's the deal. He expects you to turn again. You see, here's the thing. When I say Jesus gets you, I'm, 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 I'm worried about there's a lot of that phrase, he gets you going on. And I haven't watched the program, so I'm not talking about the program, but I've heard the phrase, he gets you, man. He knows you're weak. He knows you're just a sinner. He knows you just can't do it and blah, blah, blah. And then they stop there. You see, they stop there with this, Jesus loves you, you're okay, it's cool, even though you you know, you're, you sin and you're broke, you know, all this kind of stuff. But they don't push through to what Jesus said. He's, no, no, it says when you've turned again. What does turning again mean? It means repentance. When you have repented, strengthen your brothers. When you finally get hold of me, strengthen your brothers. In other words, I'm not expecting you to live always denying me. Jesus didn't say, now, Peter, you know what, brother. Let me, here's what a lot of people say today, and they think, they act like Jesus said this to Peter. Let me tell you what Jesus didn't say to Peter. He didn't say, now, Pete, hey, dude, look, you're going to fail me because you're just a sinner. And I know, you know, I, I get it, man. And, and you're just going to have to deny me because you just don't have it, okay? And it's okay. It's cool. It's fine. I love you anyway. It's all right. He didn't say that. He said, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. Now, when you've turned back, okay, when you've repented, I want you to strengthen your brothers. You see, that, that is, that's the other side of grace that we don't talk about. The other side of grace is that God's grace is he's there when you fail. You didn't disappoint him. You didn't catch him off guard. He knew what you were made of. But there's a place of repentance. He calls you to walk in a new obedience. He calls you to face that sin, turn from it, and walk in victory over it. And not only that, but strengthen other people and help them to walk in it too. We've got this sappy kind of sentimentalism cloaking itself as gospel out there today that says, you know, you're just a sinner. Jesus loves you. It's cool. Just keep on sinning. You're fine. Because, you you know, you're just a mess. Well, we are a mess. I get that. And, and he does love us even though we've sinned. And even, even though we're sinful, he gets that. And he does love us, but he calls us to victory that he can get. When did Peter get the victory? Read the second chapter of Acts. After Peter went through this horrible time of, of being uh, just a failure, and then he met Jesus on the shore of Galilee after the resurrection, and Jesus said, 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 feed my sheep. Do you love me? He made him reply three times, three denials, three times. He said, do you love me? Peter said, yes, you know I love you. And he said, feed my sheep. Jesus reinstated him. That's great, but there was something else. Second chapter of Acts, the Holy Spirit comes. Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit. And this man who just days earlier could not admit that he knew Jesus is standing in front of thousands of people saying you crucified him God raised him repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus and Peter Peter takes hold with fresh boldness because of the Holy Spirit who gave him the power to do what he could not have done in his own strength and so when the gospel says God understands you it doesn't mean that it, that you just kind of sit there in your sin and just kind of let him pat you on the head and tell you it's okay. He says, no, let me give you the power you need and let me transform you and let me turn you and give you victory over this so you can walk in a new level of power and obedience. He see, that's the gospel. He didn't say to the blind man on the side of the road, you know, it's okay that you're blind. It's cool. I love you. I get you, man. And uh, you sit there on the side of the road and just stay blind. He said, receive your sight. 
the woman caught in adultery facing death at the hands of, of religious hypocrites who just wanted to do her in, had no room for grace or mercy. And Jesus takes this marginalized, sinful woman and he doesn't say to her, you know, you go back to your boyfriend and tell him, hey, you know, I'm just glad you found a good relationship. And, and I just want to affirm uh, your relationships and, and your, 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 you know, your, I'm just glad you're happy. He didn't say that. He said, go and don't do this anymore. Go free. Don't sin anymore. He gave her a new way of life. And so here's the thing. is our, we, we can't do this half gospel thing where we're just telling people it's okay. It, you know, in one sense, it is okay. He absolutely loves you right where you are right now. You might be in, in this terrible mess, broken, just frustrated, and, and just like you're, you're struggling with all kind of sin, sin and temptation. He loves you right there. He absolutely does. Um, you know, he absolutely loves you, but he's calling you to freedom. And that freedom doesn't come by you sucking it up and trying to be a better person. That freedom comes by you relying on Him like Peter did. And let the Spirit of God give you the power to walk in a new level of life. Let the forgiveness of God free you from the shame and guilt of the past and let Him walk in you in something new. See, that's the gospel. The gospel is not just that God accepts you. The gospel is that God loves you too much to leave you in your sin. And He doesn't want you to die in your darkness. He wants you to live in the light. Now turn to Him by faith. Trust in Him. Let Him give you the power to live a new life. If you're struggling with pornography, He can set you free. If you're struggling with gossip and slander and greed, He can set you free. If you're struggling with uh, deception, if you're struggling with a, with a, a list of, of vices that are just a mile long, He can set you free. He loves you in the process. And it may take a while for you to really realize that freedom. You may be, if you're an addict of some sort, listen, addiction can be tough and it can be a long journey, but God calls you to freedom and he will give you freedom. If the son makes you free, you'll be free indeed. He didn't say if the son tells you it's okay, you can stay in slavery and just be okay. He said, no, I've called you to freedom. He wants the lame to get up and walk, the blind to open their eyes, the deaf to hear, the adulteress to be be holy and pure, the greedy tax collector sitting in a treetop to become a generous giver and a life giver and, and a caring person about others. He calls us to a new life. The, the Bible says if anyone's in Christ, they're a new creature. The old has passed away. The new has come. And so enough of this half gospel, uh, Jesus accepts you, patronizes you, and you just kind of sit in death until you die. He says, get up and walk. There's a freedom available to you. There's life available to you. And you know what? None of us get it all right. None of us have it all together. We all have those places in our lives, all throughout our lives, we're learning to walk in more freedom. And, the, and, and it may take years. It might happen instantaneously. But I'll tell you, and we all, I don't know that I struggle with my own sin, and, and, uh, but God never once says, okay, Mark, you just stay in that sin, you're okay. We're, we're making, we're growing out of it. We're walking in new freedom and more freedom than we had the day before. But there, there's always new frontiers, aren't there? There's always places where we need to depend on Him and come to His grace and find more freedom and more wholeness and healing. The great news is He loves you. He loves you in the journey, in the process. He doesn't wait for you to get holy and then start loving you. He loves you in the mess. But He's calling you to freedom. He's offering you real hope. He's not just saying, well, you know, it's okay. He's saying, come on, I've got you, and I love you, I care for you like you are, and even if you don't win all the battles, I'm still yours. You know, Peter didn't win all of his battles. He had other moments of failure and falling, and but he was growing, and he was living by faith, and we're saved by living by faith, and he, he had that. And so as he walked in God, God gave him more and more freedom. The Bible tells us in Corinthians chapter 3, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. And we all are beholding the Lord as if looking in a mirror or being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. Little by little, day by day, step by step, we're becoming more like Him. And that's the journey. That's the Christian journey. It's not, I woke up one day and everything was perfect. I'm walking in Him and I'm, as I 
walk more and more with him, I become more and more like him. And that's, that's how he does it. But so, friends, let, let me just encourage you today to know this. Don't sit in a, in a deception that God is somehow disappointed in you. That you failed too many times and he didn't know you were going to fail that much. Listen, when Jesus was on that cross, he saw every failure from the day of your birth to the day of your death. He saw every bit of it and he paid the price for every bit of it. Isn't that great news? That he has forgiven you. He has released you from guilt and shame. And now we just walk in the in ever increasing freedom, ever increasing glory as we get to know him and walk in him. You have not disappointed God today. Some of you are sincere Christians. One time you made a promise to God. Come on. Maybe at a revival service or a concert or in your home, you said, God, I promise this. And you tried it, you started out, and, and you failed. You, you had some failures, you had some times of brokenness. He's not disappointed. He knew what he was getting. And he loved you then, and he loves you now. He's not saying, I disapprove of you. He's not saying, you're not good enough anymore. He's saying, come, child, just keep coming to me. Come to me. If you're struggling with, uh, you know, uh, same-sex attraction, for example. If you're struggling with uh, addictions, as I've mentioned before, if you're struggling with just a thought life that's, that's just hard and dark, and you're struggling with those kind of things, listen, he's walking with you in that, and he's leading you to a better place. Don't, don't think that he's disappointed and wishes you were doing something better. He's saying, look, you just keep walking with me. You keep believing, keep trusting, and keep... Uh, stepping with me and you're going to get more and more freedom as you grow close to me listen the answer is growing close to him the answer is getting our eyes focused on him staying in his word staying in prayer staying in fellowship with other believers and we're all praying for each other because we all have places of darkness that we're being freed from we all have places of bondage we all have chains that are still falling off and so we let's walk together and let's help each other walk in him but but I, I just want to say again, don't buy into the half gospel that says, oh, God just accepts you. That's okay. That's all there is to it. No, he does accept you, but he's calling you to freedom. And this is what he has for you, and he's offering it to you. Will you trust him today? Will you walk with him today and allow him to be Savior, not only of your past sins, but Savior every day, Savior every moment, every hour. And let him be the one who sets you free. Let him walk with you today. God bless you. Go in peace.